what I actually wanted to talk about is something I'm, I've been asked to do. And, you know, I, I really am I'm hesitant to do it because it's too large of a topic. And that's Oswald Spengler. I dislike people like Oswald Spengler. I mean, I respect them. Uh, you have a lot of people who make these, these meta analyses of, of civilizations like Eric Vogel and Toynbee and, and, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a dangerous game because they have to be insanely oversimplified. So when Spengler talks about Russia, for example, he makes one error after another. It's not his fault. He, he's, he's talking about numerous nations and numerous civilizations in the same chapter. How can you not be insanely oversimplified? I really am very skeptical of these meta historians who deal with entire civilizations as if they can be summarized in a few words, which is what they all do. And when you take, you know, if you take even a family and reduce it to a couple of slogans, you're going to be wrong, or at least very, very oversimplified let alone an entire civilization. In other words, a group of nations sharing a certain common trait. A specialist in one of those nations will say this is just not true. And as much as I respect uh, the effort, and that in many areas, Spengler was absolutely correct, um, it's too simplified uh, to work. One error that he makes and I need to mention this, I'm, I'm, I'm writing on this uh, to some, to, to, at some length, is the notion of, of the Mongol influence um, on Russian, the Russian racial background. I've talked about this before. There's no reason to believe that Mongols were Asian. I'm not talking about people from Mongolia. Mongols have no records of ever occupying Russia. Genghis Khan was, at least at the time, depicted as white. Never, uh, never Asian. Now, later depictions show him that way. Um, but that's not really what I mean. Um, the genetic work on Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, um, the work, uh, even from George Vinyansky, um, uh, Marta Milinuk, um, uh, Liarchuk, B.A. Maliarchuk, uh, there's one after another after another of these genetic analyses that show precisely zero Asian roots in the Russian population. There's very few Asian words in the Russian language. In fact, um, Miliarchuk wrote, it's just, I think, I believe it's 2002. I could be wrong on that. Did a lengthy, it's actually a meta analysis of different genetic markers for Great Russian. And the conclusion that he came to, and this has been redone um, and, and, and confirmed not only in Russian but also in English and German, is that the genetic type of the Russian uh, population doesn't differ from that of Western Europe. Now we're speaking of very general terms. That Belarusians, Russians, and Ukrainians are of one type. Now this doesn't mean that it should all be one empire. I think that these should be independent states all working together for a common goal if that's how it's going to work, because occupation doesn't doesn't work. It hasn't worked in the past. Nevertheless, this has been done so many times that it has to be true. There is not a shred of Asian blood in the Russian population, even if uh, the Mongols were actually Asian. There's no reason to believe that that's true. But even if they were, there were too few of them um, administering the country, and they never occupied it in the sense that there was never a garrison in downtown Moscow, they were they ruled it indirectly. So even if it is true that they're Asian, there'd be no reason for any kind of mixture. There's far too many um, there's far too many psychological barriers for a group of people as distinct uh, as Russians versus um, Central Asians. The great um, Saint Setapan of Novgorod, who was um, writing at the time of the Mongol invasions never mentions that these people are Asians. He never even calls them Mongols. He calls them foreigners. He doesn't even say that they speak a different language. There's never any reference to having needing translators. 
They spoke Russian. And the biggest piece of evidence that I've come across is that the contemporary paintings of the battles between Russians and Mongols show both sides as absolutely identical in appearance. When they show Russians fighting, say, Turks, you can tell just by glancing at it that there's two different sides. That was not the case in any contemporary depictions of battles. And I needed to get that uh, off my chest because it's an extremely common error. People who believe that that Russians aren't Europeans, unfortunately, um, Hitler made that error. Um, the British have always really promoted the notion that they're not really a part of Europe, only because the British Empire was quite threatened by them. Uh, from the Crimean War onward, although this goes way back before then, it reached a fever pitch of the Crimean War, that they are Mongols and not Mongols meaning Asians, um, as opposed to just being a different, a different uh, ethnic group, um, with different interests of the broader European population. Of course, they're extremely different in terms of culture and tradition from the rest of Europe because of their specific location, and climate, and everything else. But of all the genetic work that's been done on Russia, I'll say it one more time, there is not a drop of Asian blood in them because there was never any reason for that. They were not occupied by a nation power. They were not administered by a nation power at any time in their history. And it's such a common thing. Now, no one in Russia believes this, that for some reason has not leaked into American life yet. And I think I know why. Because it takes away a bit of propaganda that they are this, this nefarious, mysterious Asian people who only understand tyranny or, you know, some stuff. I mean, that was a British understanding of it. Um, that was a German understanding of it. Whenever you're at war with someone, you want to make them seem, uh, sneaky and, and notorious and, and untrustworthy and things like that. And that's, uh, that's what happened. Uh, really from, from Ivan the Fourth onward. Whenever I deal with individuals, individual people on this show, I, I don't want, I think it's very vulgar to try to summarize them in just an hour. I try to focus on a handful of their more significant contributions, uh, rather than try to summarize an entire point of view, which, by the way, is precisely at odds with what people like, um, Spengler and Vogelin were trying to do. Uh, it's not to say that civilizations don't exist. They do. It's just that even a multi-volume work can only scratch the surface. It's really just, um, the way to probe the perimeters rather than to, to give any kind of detailed uh, analysis. One very powerful contribution, something where Spengler was absolutely correct on, was the infamous distinction be- between culture and civilization. Most traditionalists, whether Eastern Europe or Western Europe, made this distinction often not using the same vocabulary. Um, culture and civilization for Spengler and you see this, you know, Danileski and, and Slavophiles, uh, you see it all over the place, is one of quality. The culture is organic, it's natural, it's based on a family, it cannot be codified in words or legal systems, it's based on, on instinct, as it is reason, it can be rationalized, but it's not rational, it, 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 it's above uh, reason, it's something that simply is. Like the family. Um, you don't have to do some kind of a, a psychological analysis to prove that you need to love your family. You just do and you always, you always have. Um, the same goes for cultures. Cultures are nations. And when I say nation, I'm referring to ethnic group. Now, Spengler uses the word state, and we've mentioned this before in the show. It's unfortunate because the German, which is the same as the English, doesn't mean what it means in our uh, English uh, distortion of the word. In English, when you say state, you're referring to the apparatus of government. In other words, you're referring to the armies and police and the bureaucracy and the administration. Um, that's not the German understanding. The German understanding of the word state is the constitution. And by constitution, I'm not referring to the piece of paper um, that the basic rules are written on. That's a manifestation of the Constitution. It is not in and of itself the Constitution. The Constitution cannot be put into words. The Constitution is every form of communication. 
it's the universe of meaning that all members of the community have to have in order for them to function at all socially. When you use language, you're assuming that your hearers know what you mean in depth. And not just that the words you're using are understood in the dictionary sense of the term, um, but also in the common uh, denotative sense of the term, or I'm sorry, connotative sense of the term. So it's a heck of a lot more than just dictionary definitions. Um, and it's not just words, of course. It's gestures and tones of voice and everything else that when you get down to it is an immensely complex understanding of communication. Even your posture, how you hold your head, everything else, the, the, the way you um, describe certain things, formal versus informal and all of this, this is um, all forms of language and therefore are all ethnic. Language, as I've said many times, is not just the words and the grammar. It's all forms of communication, which is another way of saying all forms of culture. It's national. It has to be. That's that's what nations are. This is what Spengler means by state and culture. It's one and the same thing. Civilization is the decay of culture. You see this in numerous um, uh, traditionalist points of view without using that language. For us, often, civilization is not a bad term. It is for them. It is for him. Civilization is what happens when a culture begins to decay. It begins to focus on the written word. Law isn't just um, written uh, on the constitution of a people. It's something that is written down that you have to follow or you go to jail. The minute governments have to rely on coercion, they've already collapsed. The minute anyone has to rely on, on coercion to get people to do um, uh, what they need, has, has already lost. Edmund Burke says this. They've already collapsed. They've already lost legitimacy. Law is very rarely something you can write down. It only has to be written down when it gets, um, for whatever reason, uh, violated on a regular basis. Civilization is mechanical. It's inorganic. It's a system that's clinging to power and has to codify everything in order to force uh, adherence to, to its norms. It's a bad thing. Um, Donalevsky, of course, uh, the great Russian meta historian, has the exact same, has the exact same thing using different words. But there's the organic culture that as it decays, and how does it decay? It decays by becoming wealthy. The wealthier it gets, the more that the wealthy people have to protect themselves. It decays if it's taken too many traumas and doesn't have the resources to rebuild. Like the human body, for example. One disease after another, the immune system is compromised, it can't last much longer. This sort of thing. Prosperity, in the sense of increasing wealth, is just as bad as poverty. The minute you have a class that lives off money it doesn't earn, the minute you have a class that's based on parasitism, everything changes. Because when this class develops, they know that they don't deserve the money they have. They don't deserve the power that they have. They haven't, um, they haven't contributed such that that kind of income and the power that's connected to it, uh, would, would justify. Because you know, now we have, we live in, in an extreme situation. We, you know, the, the modern America, not 2018 America, has not a single positive element of it. Every aspect of it is an advanced state of decay. I'm I struggle to find something good. Um, it is it is indescribably evil. There is no theory, well, I guess, except nihilism. There is there is no theory. There is no social idea that can justify this system. And one of many obnoxious elements of it is the fact that you have people who are so wealthy. And, I mean, there's numerous problems there. That wealth automatically means immense power, that there's an, a clear one-to-one correlation there, and that this wealth could never be earned. When someone is worth a billion dollars, there is nothing you can do to contribute that much that you have earned this money. Maybe if the guy who cures cancer by himself in his basement Maybe he deserves that. And even there, um, 
Otherwise, it's based on the extraction of rent. Um, for Spengler, for Dental, for so many of these people, it, myself included, the very existence of a rent is a sign of decay and illegitimacy. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this before. It's an extremely important concept that very few people understand. A rent with a capital R is a technical term. It refers to money extracted due to a non-economic end. If you had a situation of free exchange, that money could never be extracted. It's money extracted over and above economic exchange because the person you're contracting with has a lot more power than you. I often use the example of the defense attorney. Another word for rent would be premium. You are accused of a violent crime. You're looking at a lifetime in jail. You run to a good defense attorney. You put your, you mortgage your house. You will pay anything and do anything to hire someone who will get you off and get you considered innocent of this crime. Now, what you pay the defense attorney is not just based on what it costs to function as your defense attorney. The rent charged is based on your fear. That the defense attorney will say, my God, this guy's petrified. He will do anything to get me to, to um, influence a jury that, that he's innocent or, or make him a deal or something like that. So I'm going to charge him double what I normally would because you know he's going to pay. That's an example of a rent. A bribe is a classic example of a rent. Usury is an example of a rent. Um, the word usury, in fact, doesn't just refer to um, interest rates. Usury is often a synonym for, for rent. But at the very least, usury is a subset of rent. Um, parasites are what we call rent seekers. They want to take money that has no real economic foundation, that the mere ownership of money earns you money. Which, of course, is a perversion because something that is that is not naturally fertile cannot reproduce itself. Rent-seeking or the ability to extract rent, to have it justified by the society and defended by the society, is one of the ways that you know that you have left the stage of culture and have now entered the stage of civilization and decay and death. Civilization is not a sign of decay. It is decay. By the time you reach that point, you have a state apparatus, not a state. You have an apparatus of coercion that needs to not just threaten everybody to get them to do what they want, but they need to manipulate them psychologically. We know that that an, uh, an authoritarian government that has no reason to exist uh, can't function by having a machine gun nest on every roof. You can't do that. One way, and speaking of which, one way you know you're dealing with a phony is when they're talking about a government they don't like and they say that all dissent is criminalized. When I was in grad school, I had a professor say that a friend of his, a personal friend of his, had gone to prison in Iraq for saying that Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. And I laughed at him. I said, excuse me, what government has the manpower and the resources to throw someone in jail for that? What do you mean, said he's a bad guy? What, was he at a bar or something? Was he at home? I don't care how tyrannical a government is. It can't criminalize stuff like that. It doesn't have the manpower or the money or the resources or the loyalty, even of its most fanatical enforcers, to do that. Because even fanatical supporters of a system are going to criticize it now and again. That can't be criminalized. However, the way that tyrannies operate isn't necessarily by having laws that have no legitimacy or the overuse of coercion. Um, one way that my professor uh, could have gotten out of it and didn't is to say 
that tyrannies operate by sporadic arbitrary arrests. This comes straight from Machiavelli. Um, and it's keeping people constantly off balance. Keeping people off balance means that they never know if what they say or do is going to leave them in prison. That, you know, the, the very fact that it seems to be an arbitrary system rather than a system based on regular law. It would be one thing if an unjust law existed that was prosecuted legally on a regular basis. You might not like it, but you just avoid that thing and you don't have anything to worry about. That's not how it works. Because governments don't have, illegitimate governments don't have the resources or the manpower ever to criminalize dissent. Because then even its most loyal followers will end up going to prison. It can't do that. It has to occasionally arrest the centers or occasionally have a roundup of the centers. You never quite know when you're going to be in trouble. That psychologically is far more effective than simply having this constant pressure on the population. But beyond that, that kind of coercion can't be sustained. It can be sustained in an emergency, and all societies have those periods of time. Everyone is, is on edge. There's something going on. The Civil War, whatever it is, uh, that's okay. And no one denies that governments once in a while have to do this. It can't be done all the time. Liberalism, and liberal capitalism, has, and this is this is something that Spengler um, only slightly deals with. Given the time period he was writing, he couldn't possibly. I mean, this was only being seen for the first time. Uh, it is central to the thought of Alexander Dugan. In fact, if anything, his political theory can be reduced to to this one concept: that liberal capitalism is a form of totalitarianism because. Um, and it works nefariously because it doesn't use the state. It doesn't use the public sector. It doesn't use traditional forms of coercion. Liberal capitalism, especially in media and journalism, rules tyrannically because it alters the meaning of words, because it molds minds. It tells you what is good to want. It's able to tell you what's real and what isn't. Liberal capitalism is based as much on psychology as anything else. It completely blurs the distinction between needs and wants. It reduces people to consumers by telling them that there is no passion that should not be satisfied, no drive, no instinct, no desire that shouldn't be satisfied. And we can satisfy that for you for a fee. The government doesn't do that. Private sector entities do that. One sign of illegitimacy, uh, I should really, as we said, you know, one sign of being ignorant. Um, someone who's, you know, a thaw intellectual, pseudo intellectual, is that they will believe or imply that only governments can be totalitarian or tyrannical. Governments make very bad tyrants. Up until the modern era, you couldn't, you, there was no such thing as a totalitarian system because no government had that kind of power. They didn't have a mass media. They didn't have mass journalism. Um, and they simply, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the, you know, the, the, the police apparatus would be so huge to do that. It's not possible. Um, Authoritarianism meant control over the elites up until really the 20th century. All politics was, was local and the central state simply couldn't penetrate to that level. It existed in the cities, but usually it meant that the elites were kept under constant surveillance. That back then was seen as authoritarianism. Only the 20th century developed the media and the psychological factors where everyone was kept under surveillance in the name of, of progress. Every um, development in technology has this shadow element. Liberal capitalism is totalitarianism 
because it's based on the satisfaction of passions and drives. Uh, you know, everything, everything has a price. And you live in an environment where every passion should be indulged in one form or another. And you could be convinced by social sanction, keeping up with the Joneses or, you know, you know, uh, advertising, everything else, or these concepts being, you know, slowly sprinkled into, into day to day life that you need something. To be considered successful, you have to have a house down the shore. You have to have a Lexus. You can't just get a Camry. It has to be a Lexus. Um, you have to have a certain level of jewelry. You have to have certain kinds of clothes. And if you show up to a function without it, you are not in the club. And even more, that attractive women won't be interested in you. More than anything else, that passion controls men. I am absolutely convinced. I know this for a you know, No one can, can change my mind. That... Men are essentially minimalists. The only reason they care about the, the homes and the cars and the clothes is that women are interested in that. And that's what will get you the, the attention of attractive females. That is the only reason why men care about that kind of thing. Otherwise, it's a lot of money and a lot of upkeep for flashing, you know, <laughs> just maybe, you know, being flashy for the neighbors. That, that doesn't make much sense to me. Men indulge um, themselves in a huge amount of uh, luxury goods because women demand it, either women that they want or women that they already have. 80% of discretionary spending in America is female. That's been documented over and over again, most recently by the Harvard Business Review. Um, you know, the economy is female because men don't really care that much. And I'm saying this because this is how a regime can get into every cell in the social body. It is so far superior than having a policeman in every corner. Having, you know, secret service sprinkled throughout the country. That's clumsy. Those guys can be bribed. It, it, no government has that kind of money. That no government has a manpower for that. It's always very fragile. If you have a police apparatus that large, why wouldn't the heads of that apparatus take orders from the dictator? If the dictator is dependent on them, that means they can decide who the dictator is. It's ultimately a self-defeating. So, because it doesn't rely on the state, liberal capitalism uh, is absolutely thoroughgoing totalitarian. Because the desires that human beings have uh, deal with every facet of life. A totalitarian system is it is based on the regulation of every aspect of life. Now, in the modern world, every aspect of life is amenable to political regulation, and therefore it's built into the system. But the way that postmodern liberal capitalism functions, our society functions, is that you make it profitable to regulate and control those aspects of life. That means handing it over to the private sector. It's the very core of oligarchy. Oligarchy is not just that a handful of very powerful, um, uh, very wealthy people, uh, you know, run, run politics. No, it's also a state of mind that having certain things is the end of, of humanity. That to be a success is identical with being wealthy. That someone who is wealthy by winning the lottery is as successful as someone who is wealthy by producing something that everyone wants or inventing something like that. For Spengler, I'm just, I'm just focusing on this one element of, of his thought, um, what makes civilization a bad thing is civilization manifests decay, but it gets worse. And the way that you measure how bad it's getting is how much quantitative things, money especially, comes to define previously qualitative and, and, and um, rank-based goods. In modern America, if you use the word class, 
you automatically are, your, your mind has been hardwired into thinking of money. There's an upper class, a middle class, and a lower class. And those are defined by income or wealth that they have. But that's not the definition of class. That's never been, the, only, only an oligarchy uh, can convince people that that's the definition of class. No, class and rank are the same. Class traditionally, up until the 19th century, has been based on function, not on income. But when money has dissolved distinctions among things and becomes a good in and of itself, rank and function no longer have meaning. Um, you have a lot of people, especially people who come from uh, the middle classes or lower classes, who have a superstition that somehow the mere possession of money provides class, what they, what they would call class, classy behavior, intelligence, uh, refinement. My mother's like this. A lot of people are like this. They, they just, they're ignorant and they don't realize that it's something you have to work for. It's an aristocratic, not an oligarchic world. An aristocrat could be poor. An aristocrat is someone who, um, has mastered his, his passions. And they've mastered their passions, uh, mastered self-interest, I should say, to serve the common good. That's what an aristocrat is. But it is so easy for such people to become oligarchs where their world is based entirely on cash. The way it works in Spangler's mind is very common is that intelligence, that is to say the use of logic, becomes identical with knowledge. Um, what I mean there, I'm pretty sure what he means there is that formal technique is identical with knowledge. And Michael Oakeshott says the same kind of thing. That to be knowledgeable is to know how to be trained in something rather than educated in something. Because possession of, of money and wealth is the be-all and end-all of humanity, population begins to decline. Because you are wealthier, the fewer children you have. The problem you have is that because income uh, is so important, buying luxury items, or at least possessing luxury items, is so important that labor is worked more and more and more. When Western tastes begin to take over Tsarist Russia, for example, you had a kind of a really vulgar, very full westernized elite forcing more and more out of their peasants to be able to afford luxuries imported from, from the West. It was a terrible crime against against the population and separated the state from the common people. This is this is the Slavophile argument. Um, writers like Dostoevsky and Gogol used to make fun of the arist- so-called aristocracy. Speaking French was considered refinement. So even your you know, very low-level nobles pretended that you know, they ended up being gibberish most of the time because they just didn't know. But trying to speak French was a way that you showed the world that you were um, cosmopolitan. More and more, the disconnect with the common people were uh, was um, was manifest, and the legitimacy of the system, especially in the eighteenth century, began to decline. Urban civilization, I mean, you know, the, the, the decay of culture into civilization, uh, is very similar, but not identical to increased mass urbanization. The larger the city grows, the greater the demands for luxury items amongst the urban elites, the urban population in general, the pressures put on the countryside become unbearable. Now, the concept of, of sacrifice as a religious concept um, comes up again and again. Why was it that the Canaanite civilization, wherever it's gone, sacrificed children to Moloch? What was the point of this? Um, how did it get that way? Well, it's not distinct from abortion. If you destroy a, a, a child in the womb because you, you know, it wouldn't interfere with your career and money making. That is exactly the same thing as sacrificing a child for 
uh, greater harvests or more financial success. It's the exact same thing. Michael Hoffman um, was the first one to teach me this concept. And that is the notion of sacrifice as it gets more and more intense over time comes into existence in proportion to the increasing demands made upon the natural order, which often refer to the countryside. The natural, that nature will only give so much. Civilization increases that in demands and demands and demands. And so mechanisms have to be developed to force an unnatural, um, an unnaturally large amount from natural sources. Forcing nature to give far more than it normally would. In order for that to happen, sacrifice is necessary. Death, um, somehow is connected with excess. Sacrificing children is just one element of that. Uh, another element would be um, the automobile. As I mentioned this before, you know, um, how many deaths does 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 automobile cause every every year? Um, the amount of money that it takes to maintain roads, the taxes and, and tolls and everything else, the upkeep in cars, the the psychological toll that driving takes on people. Um, all of that would be a sacrifice granted um, because the human mind isn't made for that kind of speed. A natural form of, uh, of transportation, of course, would be a horse or, or the river or something like that. When you increase it, double it, triple it, you then have to ex- sacrifice something. You sacrifice in terms of death, you sacrifice in terms of, of psychological pain, constant expense and everything else. You can think of a million examples of how this could be the very grid necessary that civil- civilization demands is more than the natural order would ever give. It is an unnatural concept. The very fact of, you know, the, the, the Solomon's Temple that um, Peter the Great, for example, thought was, he was imposing on nature in northern Russia to create Petersburg. Solomon's Temple is a, not the transfiguration of nature that you have in the Christian idea, but the replacement of nature, being able to improve on it to such an extent that it becomes a purely human notion. Spengler's idea, and this was done long before it really was became um, uh, well known. Um, he was one of the first, actually. It'd be both, you know, you have nineteenth-century writers doing this too. Nineteenth uh, and early twentieth-century writers doing this. You know, you have the idea that civilization is what you get when elites demand more for the natural order than it would normally give. As cities grow in wealth and power, the countryside is violated more and more. Not just our increasing number of people taken from it, but to be able to, be able to feed these, um, these huge cities requires the regimentation of peasant life to the point where it just becomes one big mechanism in and of itself, like you have today in, with agribusiness. The family farm isn't just about producing food, it's about producing people. It's a cooperation with nature and a knowledge of nature. As I've said before, um, Russian intellectuals, even, even uh, liberal ones in the 19th century, began to discover that the Russian peasant was in fact brilliant. They would come back from studying him saying he could talk to animals. He could actually, he knows so much about how things grow and develop that it's almost as if there's no real border between the peasant and that which he works on, the soil and the, and the, and the growth, and that the concept of talking to animals was extremely common. They know each other so well that where one ends and the other begins is almost impossible to discern. People coming from the city, seeing this for the first time, um, are overwhelmed with wonder. They have no idea what they're looking at. They live a life so artificial and so based on training and intelligence rather than actual wisdom and instinct. Talking about Oswald Spengler, um, Again, I'm only talking about this one aspect of him because it's center of really the, the great contribution that he's given. He's many others, and we'll talk about that some other time. But the notion of the decay of culture, nation, family, essentially we've all wanted the same thing, the extended family, of course, into civilization. And when that remains unchecked, 
the pressure that it places on everything else is intolerable, intolerable and overwhelming. And we talk about you know, GMOs and the destruction of the family farm and the replacement of the person by the ego, um, the community by the collective, two very different things. This is what we're talking about. And it's essential. You want to make one first step into breaking free from the liberal um, postmodern ideology. That's your first step. Understanding the difference between civilization and culture. The difference between the organic and the inorganic relative to social forms. Anyway, thank you for listening, everyone. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Donate to Father Matt Johnson at RussJournal.org. RUSJournal.org.